Could you speak a little bit of Bengali for us? <laughs> Afni Balani. <laughs> that means how are you in a respectful way. That was like way. super American. <laughs> I, <laughs> I, was like, I was like, is she speaking like, is that <laughs> Do you want some tea? Ever, my Bengali family thinks I speak more like Chinese. And <laughs> <laughs> so they're like, why are you speaking this way? I'm like, I hear it this way. <laughs> That's all I hear it. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh everyone. I'm Aisha Rosalie. I'm with Marilyn. Hi, Assalamualaikum. <laughs> um, so, you're a convert to Islam for six years? Yes, almost seven. Okay, yeah. mashallah. And um, you said there's not really many like videos online about your convert story, so... Mm. No, so I'll backtrack. So, originally I'm American. Mashallah. And Americans, from my own experience, have a naivety when it comes to Islam. So I grew up thinking Muslim was a religion and Islam was not. <laughs> and I had no idea. You of... said Islam was ISIS. Yes, I know. I was like, should I say that online? I don't know. But yeah, I had yeah. literally thought that Islam was ISIS. Like that was so correlated. And I had no other differentiating idea. The movies, the media, the whole portrayal of Islam was very different growing up. I think I had I had one Muslim friend in my entire like 20 years. So I definitely had no idea. I grew up in Wisconsin, which is very white suburban America mm -hmm. and a very small, small towns, still a little bit like city vibes, but nothing compared to London. And I had gone on my own spiritual journeys. My family grew up, um, my mom had also gone on her spiritual journey. So my grandparents were Catholic. Mm -hmm. My grandpa, I think, was Protestant, which is still Christian, all Christianity, but still different ways to practice. Yeah. And my mom had gone more into the non-denominational okay. version of Christianity. So didn't follow a church anymore, but studied, like how we would have Tessir and to mm -hmm. learn, reading about the Quran. She was in red, started reading the Bible with the teacher fully. Oh, wow. So we didn't grow up uh, eating pork. Yeah. We didn't grow up with certain things that are very similar to Islam, but oh I God. had no idea. But for my mom, that was huge because Mexicans love their pork and, and everything. Yeah. And so for her, she'd have to say, oh, no, like I'm not eating that. And, and that, I think, gave her her own journey. But for me, I still had no idea, but I... I kind of went into a stage that I was like, oh, I used to say that I was agnostic. I was like, Warren Buffett's agnostic. So am I. Like, I love protecting that anymore. But that was <laughs> where that history had gone to. But I went on, like, a spiritual path to figuring out my own life because I had thought I was going to become a doctor. I thought I was going to live this picket fence life, a small family in Wisconsin, like, married, straight away type thing. And when that didn't necessarily work out, I had to go on the spiritual journey and I had started like an online business, went to Bali, Indonesia, was living like Instagram life that from the outside it looked amazing that doing yoga on five star beaches looked incredible but there was something I had felt so sad on the inside, there was something missing even though I was doing yoga five times a day. Five times a day? Five times a day. Oh my god, like prayer. <laughs> like actually going into yoga oh and... God. I had a guru who was my teacher, like doing so many different things that I was like, okay, this is, I was doing it for like more of the aesthetics and fun rather, but I was still like, okay, something's missing. And I had gone to Fiji, which is a close trip away from Bali with one of my friends. And she at the time was studying in Australia and she wanted to go skydiving. And so I'd never been, I didn't have a fear for sky, but skydiving, I didn't have a desire to do it. I was like, okay, cool, Kel wants to do it, like, let's go. It was like a girl's trip experience. So we went skydiving. Have you ever been skydiving? No. Okay. Well, if you ever do it in a, a beautiful place, Fiji is the place to do it. It's um, so beautiful. You go up, and you, so I was going up 30,000 feet, again, like, not just really going for the experience, and... There's this moment that you go into a free fall and you jump out the plane and it's all of a sudden like so cold. <laughs> it's such a cold journey and then you, when the parachute pulls, you go into like a warm environment. It's like whoosh, just so beautiful and I had felt the most blissful that I had ever felt in my life. Wow. And I 
when I landed, I was like, Kelly, I'm going to become a skydiver. And she was like, okay, cool, Mare. Like, sounds good. And I had thought, like, that was, like, what I was needed. But on that way home from Fiji back to Wisconsin, I had a layover in London. Mm -hmm. And I was going to a Tony Robbins event. So I was like, okay, cool, good timing. And that time there were essentially a Tony Robbins event. There's, like, 10,000 people when he was doing in-person events before the virtual. So there's 10,000 people in live in the Excel. And for me, I'm more of an introvert. I love talking about I'm like 10,000 people still like overwhelming. Yeah. Again, I was coming from like the islands, like yeah. <laughs> island life. And so the group that I was with, because you kind of get paired off in like different pods, were all Muslim. And majority of them with some and then they were going on the events Thursday through Sunday so Thursday we all connected Friday they were all leaving to go pray at the masjid for Jummah and I was like still in this mindset that I was like mm, can women even pray is that allowed and <laughs> yeah exactly I was like yeah I'm sure like women are allowed to do this like what is this and then I had never seen somebody practice like their religion that they're like they were praying like five times a day it was something I had not seen it because we grew up instead of going to church on Sundays we would watch like there'd be football games or cheerleading competitions that was more of the how I grew up I'm sure there are other people different but that was me and so when these people went to the masjid that I had gone to at the end, I was like my first experiencing learning how to pray. Like I wore this oversized like hoodie. Somebody had extra and, and like not even a, like a random like somebody's like warm scarf. Oh so one of the sisters at the masjid just kept like trying to pull like the <laughs> scarf down. Oh and I was like thinking, who's touching me? I had no idea. And I literally had it. I didn't know any of the movements. So everything was going on. I just kept looking around me like, okay. <laughs> like go to the next step and oh then I God, that is awesome. rushed out so quickly but on Fridays they do the khutbah the sermon and I keep thinking is either at the masjid or at the Tony Robbins event someone said like practices if you believe in God will guide you that's the one message I took with me so I took it with heart and I left to back to Wisconsin and I had a little prayer mat one of the, uh, the people in the group gave me I had a prayer mat Learn from Wikipedia how and to pray. <laughs> yeah, I, so I went to Wisconsin at my parents' house. Gone to, I was like literally in my room, like had this prayer, like had to find which way to pray. I still remember like that first prayer. And I had Wikipedia on how on the side and I was like look, looking back and forth. And in sujood, that first, which I had no idea was sujood. Yeah. So I, my head was on the prayer mat. I was there and all of a sudden that same blissful feeling that I had gotten from skydiving had come over and I was like when I said I like gave my songs I was like this is what I'm meant to do and <laughs> like mm -hmm. this is the feeling of where I, and I literally took my shahada right then and there like in the room like from Wikipedia <laughs> and I was like okay cool I'm Muslim now and then that, that was how I went very much oh, on that man. spiritual path. It made me a little bit emotional because yeah. <laughs> I, that power, the power of sujood, I mean, so you do a lot of mentorship, mm -hmm. um, you help women with, I mean, you can tell me a little bit about what you do mentorship wise. Yeah, so I do a lot of the business coaching where we focus on mindset with, mm -hmm. because of the ladies, we do a lot of the mindset of work in terms of figuring out what your unique ability is, where your strengths are, focusing on those strengths. Mm -hmm. And just setting those skill sets up so that you can run your business to outsource and to do essentially your expertise in the online space. So we do a lot of mindset and strategy. For someone who works in that industry with mindset and stuff, I don't know if you've come across this theory about what happens when you put your head to the ground, about the blood rushing to your head. Have you come across this? Tell me more. So like science says that like when you're um, when you put your head to the ground when the blood is rushing to your head it's like one of the only moments you can actually feel like relax. Subhanallah. So it's really interesting that in the sujood you felt that because I felt that as well when I first became Muslim. I mean sometimes I still feel it now if I'm properly connected in prayer. Not always, but inshallah. Inshallah, <laughs> inshallah we can always be yeah. fully connected in prayer. But when I'm fully connected and I'm not distracted by the outside world, I'm just focusing what I'm doing. I put my head to the ground and the blood rushes to my head I get that relaxation feeling that I think you're talking about a hundred percent that is definitely mm -hmm. it it was way more intense 
because I had that reference of literally jumping out of the plane, that blissful feeling. So yeah. I don't think everyone thinks jumping out of the plane is blissful. Yeah. <laughs> but for me, it had given that relaxation. And now I think it, I compare it a lot more with that unknowingly, it's that unknowing trust in Allah. It's mm -hmm. that unknowing trust in God. You have to, when you're jumping out of a plane or when you have your head done to the prayer mat, you have to trust that there is a higher power, that it's Allah, that it's something that it's like somebody else is taking care of you completely. Even if you have no idea what's going on, somebody else is really running the things for you and is constantly has that, has your back, has, has you with the best interest for you. Yeah. So that was for me that experience. So even now, like I still, I know like everything, like, okay, Allah wants the best for me. Like we, like Allah is what, we think of him and I always like to think of that goodness more than like uh, anything else I'm like yeah okay even from like if it's raining if the night it's not oh no it's a crappy day it's mm -hmm. subhanallah like I get to say the rainbow mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. Allah wants me to take away my sins like okay <laughs> cool like <laughs> something there's always goodness and even things that we think are might not necessarily be the best but there's always goodness in it. SubhanAllah. So it sounds like you were doing quite a lot of spiritual practices while you were in Bali. So what's the difference between that life you were living of the five times yoga a day compared to being a Muslim? I, in the most simple ways, I think that when you're do, doing something thinking that it's a higher power instead of Allah, is that Allah has given us the guidelines of things and learning those guidelines are incredibly important because otherwise you we as humans tend to do things based off of our like our lower self our desires and so even if you're doing spiritual spirituality and you don't have a guideline in which way to connect with Allah then you're following like more so the nafs you're following that lower self rather than following what's best for you. Now I'm not a scholar, I don't know all of these things, so I do the best that I can, but I know that with that, like, with the love of Allah, it also means like you have to follow like a certain side of things where most people will look at and from the outside with some world of like, why would you follow rules when society is telling you complete opposite? Yeah but look at how society is now in so much chaos. And I think that it gives you that organization within the chaos. Mashallah. What about being a covering woman? Like, how does that feel? Because I mean, you grew up in America where America is very much on materialism and like how you look and everything. Mm -hmm. So what is it like being a covered woman now? It's, this is the biggest shift for me because at my, before I was Muslim, being like the most modest outfit that I had was literally like a summer maxi dress that didn't even cover my legs like it was very much a tank top I remember I had like thrown on a scarf and I was like wearing a maxi tank top and I was like oh my god! I went gosh. through that phase yeah. as well so I can't <laughs> yeah, judge. Went through, like all it's yeah. so crazy but the concept of like what is modesty was really different because mm -hmm. what I would consider at that time modesty is definitely like not the same for us and so I think that being covered now it definitely gives me more of a freeing approach in terms of having that ability to it's it's like a freeing protection because I know of course like there was definitely a tension that was given before I was Muslim that wasn't good like it wasn't a good intention but it's something that you're like oh cool like now like if other people are looking at you in yeah. like this way like as if it's like a prize but it's really yeah. not like I don't understand how I used to think that but that was the way so I think it's like more of a freeing protection that is given to being modest and I think this is like a misconception because men also have their modesty in Islam as well mm -hmm. But it's not the same in society because I know for my husband, like when we look for like sh uh, swim shorts for him, they're all above the knee. Yeah. But men are supposed to cover below their knee. Yeah. So even men have that conversation of what is modest and what's not. And it's not necessarily as, as driven in the world because mm. you'll see... For Muslims, a lot of the times everyone sees a woman in a hijab and then they're like, okay, you're covered Muslim woman. 
but they're not seeing that the man's hijab is their beard or mm -hmm. it's they're covering their knees like covering from their belly buttons not mm -hmm. wearing tight shirts like we both have it and it's yeah. both a freeing protection for both of us yeah mashallah so where's wealthy women yes which i'll link in the description and the comments inshallah why did you start it what is your mission yeah so for wealthy women i had started it because there was a gap in the market mm -hmm. there was a gap in the market with men and women that when man was doing something in the business side of things they were going they were doing this hustle grind the women were still in the conversation of like focusing on color palette and thinking like That's me. what are other people gonna think of me, me. <laughs> or it comes down to this concept of not being enough and I think as like a society it's hugely driven of women having to comp comp compare themselves to men but in reality we're not the same mm -hmm. but we're both have an equal amount of respect with us but women have our own power and our own uniqueness and our own strength mm -hmm. and it's beautiful when we honor that and focus on that and a lot of the times in the market when I had first started the m there were a lot of male coaches teaching more hustle mentality grind mentality what we call now bro marketing whereas for women it doesn't work the same mm -hmm. we're not driven that way and I had done a survey with uh, ladies and I was like what so if you had the three choices, essentially what drives you? Is it making money? Is it uh, doing something out of your passion? Is it helping others? Which one drives you the most? And 90% of them said passion. It was a, some passion was driving them more so than money and even more so than helping course, others. Yeah. And whereas men, like 90% of the time, it's like money. Yeah. Granted, it can be to take care of everyone. They might have their own their own things, but. For women, we needed our own set of, of conversations to have better mindset coaching, to mm. have better business strategy, because it's not the same. We are mothers, we are sisters, we're aunties, we are the caregivers of society. Yeah. And that comes with a lot of different conversations, because while we're the caregivers of society, mm. we also have to do it with a smile. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, we, in reality, like we do have our low points and we do need a sisterhood and a community mm -hmm. and a place to support each other of collaboration over competition yeah. and that's where I want wealthy women to grow to being a place for ambitious women to come together to collaborate mm -hmm. to help each other grow mashallah that's amazing okay well thank you so much for coming on yes thank you and uh, thank you for sharing your story and make sure you guys check out wealthy women inshallah um thank you guys for watching assalamualaikum